Abby. And I'm Taylor. And this is a Voice of America Student Union live stream. Uh, today we're going to be talking about EB-5 visas for students. We have a student, or a former student here, Ishan Khanna, who has an EB-5 visa. Um, and Ishan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So uh, can you just start off by telling our viewers a little about yourself? Where did you go to school? Sure. Um, so I'm originally from New Delhi, India. I graduated from high school in 2012, and I went to Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. I uh, graduated with a degree in information systems. And uh, I mean, I think it was like junior, senior year of college when I, I kind of knew that hey, I want to stay in the US. I had worked a little bit. I had done some internships. And uh, I was extremely motivated to stay in the US no matter what. And you came on an F1, right? A student visa? That's right. And can you tell us a little bit about your experience? Where did you, what, what kind of visa did you try to get before getting an EB-5? Right, so I, I mean, I had a tourist visa back in the day when I was young to come visit America. But when it came to studying in the US, I had to go get an F1. Um, I applied for it. I went for the visa interview, got the visa. Studied, uh, I, know, had a, I was allowed to study for four years, and I got one year of work experience after that on the OBT. And can you explain uh, to our viewers what an EB-5 visa is exactly? So essentially, an EB-5 visa is an immigrant visa. Uh, when I was on an F1, I tried to get an H-1B as well, a work visa. I My application didn't make it to the lottery, but Essentially, that was one way that I could stay in the U.S. Now, the F-1, the H-1B, and similar visas, they're all non-immigrant visas. As in, you're there in the U.S. to either study or to work. You're there for a, a singular purpose. The EB-5, it's an immigrant visa. You're essentially stating to the U.S. government, I want to stay here. I want to make the U.S. my home. So the EB-5 falls under the immigrant category visa. You apply for it. As long as you do the process properly, you get a green, you get a conditional green card first, and then you get a permanent green card. Okay. Were there any issues with you? Because the F-1 visa, being a non-immigrant visa, you can't demonstrate an intent to immigrate while you have it. Was there an issue then transitioning to the EB-5? Absolutely not. You can apply for the EB-5 no matter if you have an F-1, if you have an H-1B or if you don't have a visa at all. Even if you're outside the country, you can always apply for the EB-5. OK. And can you explain to our viewers sort of how the process works? You know, you're investing, but where can you invest? How much money do you have to invest? And what are the, the goals of the EB-5 program? Sure. So just to give you guys a little bit of history, but I mean, back in the 90s, the US government started this program as a way to sort of pump money into the US economy. So what essentially investors had to do was invest money into a US entity or, or a business as long as it met two requirements, as long as the money was at risk and as long as 10 American jobs were created. The person, the applicant, and, the, and his family was allowed to get green cards. Now, essentially, I think the program is great. It's at no cost to the American taxpayer. It brings in jobs to the US economy. And essentially, now what you can do today is invest in a entity or a real estate construction business or anything like that. And uh, you know, invest your money in, wait five years, get it back after five years. During this period of time, you can get a conditional green card. And finally, at the end of your five years, you get a permanent green card. And can you explain to us what regional centers are? So essentially, I, I don't like calling them regional centers, but think of them as investment issuers. Now, your invest, you know, your EB-5 investment has to be a very specific type of investment. You can't just uh, buy an existing business with 10 employees and say, oh, I bought that and I pumped money to the economy. That's not how it works. So essentially, what investment issuers, or I guess regional centers are, are they issue investment options that you can put your money into that would create 10 new jobs that would also put your money at risk, would actually utilize your money into creating these 10 jobs. OK, so if you're just joining us, this is a Voice of America student union live stream. We're here with Ishan Khanna, 
um, a former graduate, or a recent graduate, rather, who uh, just got an EB-5 visa. Um, Tanner, do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, so what can you tell our viewers what exactly you invested in when you were looking into getting an EB-5? Sure. So, look, uh, uh, the USCIS rules with, when it comes to the EB-5 is that your investment must be at risk, meaning that your money cannot be guaranteed, meaning that when you're going into doing the EB-5, you have to keep in mind that, hey, I could lose all my money tomorrow. So my advice that I give to EB-5 investors, and I guess advice that I followed, is to find the investment option that minimizes your risk as much as possible. So what I what I really looked for in a, in a project, in a in investment option, was you know which which project is going to keep my money safe, which one is going to make sure that they create a job so I get my green card. So keeping all this in mind, I started doing my homework. I looked at all, all the different options out there. I looked. I mean, I, I spoke to a number of regional centers on investment issuers. I spoke to advisors, immigration attorneys, and I did my homework. And then finally, I selected the project that I liked. I ended up investing in a Four Seasons hotel. It's located in Puerto Rico. Um, I'm pretty happy with my investment. Things have gone so well so far. Uh, I'm glad that my investment has helped the Puerto Rican economy as well. So I'm pretty happy with the way things have turned out so far. And, and you were going through this when you were still in school, right? What was it like having all that research to do on top of a senior year workload? It wasn't easy. Um, I, usually, typically, I, I think that normally a person can do the EB-5 research within about, say, about a couple of months. I took six months. I took my own sweet time to do it. But, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a lot of work. And you know, for me, it is a big deal because a lot of the funds weren't coming from what my earnings. My earnings were barely making a big portion of it. Most of it came from my family. And you know, if I if I'm going to put make an investment when I'm putting my family's money at risk, you have to do your due diligence and your homework. So I took a long time to did a lot of scouting, had a lot of conversations before I made my final decision. Okay, so who helped you along the way when you were working on getting this? Um, so I think the biggest help that I got was from my immigration attorneys. Uh, I found a law firm very close to college that I really liked. Uh, their name was they was Wal Walter Rosenthal. Uh, the one particular attorney in particular, Robert Blanco, he you know sat down with me, explained to me the whole process. Was very very patient with me, explained to me how everything worked, and. With that basic knowledge, I started speaking with people. Um, I think it's really, really, I mean, there's, there's two aspects, two entities when it comes to the EB-5. Like you mentioned, the regional centers, that's one. The other bigger entity is the immigration attorney. Now, this is really important because the immigration attorney essentially is the one who's supposed to have your back. If something goes wrong with your investment, maybe the investment issuer isn't paying your money back, the first person you approach is your immigration attorney. So. And that was really important for me. So I'm really happy with mine. He helped me out initially, gave me all the basic information I needed, patiently spoke with my parents, explained them everything, and that was really important. Um, and were there any school resources that you used? No. Uh, I mean, I'll be honest, I don't think really schools are equipped or uh, required to actually help you with this. This is something that's... Uh, not really. I guess no. No, I think the answer is no. Okay, so if you're just joining us, uh, this is a Voice of America Student Union live stream. We're talking about students and EB-5 visas with Ishan Khanna. And um, what's your sense of how many students get EB-5 visas, either while they're still in school or as a way to stay in the U.S. after graduation? Well, I mean, I'll be perfectly honest. Uh, the EB-5, it's it's for those who really have the resources to do it. It is a half a million dollar investment, five hundred thousand dollars, three point four crores for people back home. Uh, but essentially, if it's for students who really have the money and you know the resources from their family in order to do this, so it's not very. I'd say it's, it's, it's not that many students that do it. 
it's hard to quantify in numbers saying that, oh, these many students or this percentage. It really depends on the wealth, socioeconomic status, uh, their motivation for doing it. So, yeah, I, I, I'd say in my year, in my class of 2016 at my college, I, I was probably one of two people that did it. And, you know, when we talked earlier, you said that when you were applying for jobs and internships after graduation, not having a green card or lawful permanent resident status was really a handicap. Can you tell that? Can you explain that to our viewers? Sure. Um, so I was information systems major. I went out for job interviews and everything, just like everyone else. Look, I'll be honest with everyone. If you don't have a green card, if you don't have U.S. citizenship status, it is really hard to get a job in America. If and especially on a student visa, the employer knows that you're only allowed to work for a year. They know that they're going to have to sponsor you. It's going to cost them money. It's going to cost them time. And there's also a risk that you may not even get your visa sponsorship. So a lot of them don't want to invest that year year's worth of effort into you. So. What a lot of employer, a lot of employers don't employ people who need visas, visa sponsorship in the future. So for me, I was lucky to eventually find one, but it was not an equal platform when it came to finding jobs. One of the biggest things for me was I wanted to go work with a DoD contractor, a Department of Defense contractor, something like a SpaceX, Boeing, Raytheon. I actually interviewed with SpaceX, but at the end of the day, none of them could employ me because I wasn't allowed to get security clearance. I didn't, I didn't have a green card, didn't have citizenship. So it definitely did not feel like an equal playing field. So how was your transition um, coming to school here, like coming from another country? I mean, it, it has its ups and downs. Uh, it, 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 there's always an initial culture shock, but once you get over it and you manage to assimilate, I think that uh, life becomes quite easy. And for me, for someone who, you know, did a couple of internships, started working in corporate America, and then realized that, hey, this is so much better and there's so much room for growth over here rather than back in India, I think, you know, I suppose you could say I almost, I fell in love with it. So I, and I, I was highly motivated to stay here. So overall, let's say kind of positive. So earlier you talked about how when you were applying to jobs, it wasn't an equal platform. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little more? What did you mean when you said that? Well, I mean, I'll just I'll give you an example. Like I gave the example of a DOD contractor. It, typically, they need someone who is has a green card holder or has U.S. citizenship so that they can work on certain projects that usually require government clearance. I I would basically so that so that set of employees is completely gone. That being said, uh, a typical tech company may or may not hire you. A lot of them know that if they bring you on, it's a risk because in a year from now or three years from now, you will require a sponsorship, visa sponsorship of sorts. And even though if the application is perfect, everything is correct, there is still a lottery system to go through. To get an H-1B, your chances are minuscule. When you apply for it, there's about two, three million people applying for it. They only give us 65,000 visas. Chances are you may not get it. And if you don't get it, you're supposed to, you know, close up, you know, close up shop over here, move back to your country, and that's that. So that means all the time and money that your employer has invested in you is now basically gone to waste. So a lot of times, employers will, are not willing to take that risk, and they'd rather just hire an American who they know is going to be there. And what are the other advantages of having a green card over an H-1B? Well, I mean, for the fact that you can travel in and out easily, the fact that uh, you can work anywhere without sponsorship. You can, I mean, the main thing about having a green card is that there's all the restrictions that you face as a student, as a as an H-1B holder, requiring sponsorship, you know, requiring travel documents everywhere. It 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 really alleviates all of that. You can apply if you apply for college. You can apply for in-state uh, tuition benefits. More scholarships are open to you. I mean, essentially. Well, I have it right here. Having this card opens up doors that would not have been open to you normally if you have worn an F1 student visa or an H1B. 
Okay. Um, so do you think that overall the process of getting an AB5 is worth it? Look, it, it costs a lot of money. I mean, aside from the $500,000 investment, you've got admin fees, which could be about $50,000. You've got legal fees, which is about $25,000, and filing fees, which is another $5,000. It is a lot of money. I would tell people that if you're really, really motivated to stay in the U.S., if you can pull the resources from friends, family, you know, take home, I've seen people take home equity loans, uh, sell assets back in their countries, uh, pool in resources from grandparents, etc. Uh, I would say do it only if it's worth it to you. The really, the cost of doing the EP5 is the interest you could have earned on the money had it been like a mutual fund investment, a real estate investment. Essentially, EB-5 investments don't get you a lot of return. You, a typical safe, a good project will probably get you half a percent a year. It's not a lot of money back. So you're missing out a lot of interest that you could have earned. So as long as you're willing to forgo that cost, as long as you're aware that the real return investment is your green card, then only would I recommend that, hey, it's, it's worth it for you. Um, so for our viewers just joining us, can you recap your EB-5 experience? Sure. So um, senior year of college, I'm on an F-1 visa. I know that I want to stay in the U.S. pretty badly. So start doing my research. I've got my parents in India doing theirs. We find, we talk, you know, decide upon the EB-5 visa. We start, you know, talking to immigration attorneys, start talking to investment issuers or regional centers. And one thing leads to another. I uh, found an immigration attorney I liked. I found an investment issue I liked. I liked EB-5 United. Um, EB-5 United, in fact, works on doing really low risk, low yield projects. They really, their main focus is on getting investors their green card and getting them their money back in five years. And their investment option, quite frankly, had the most investor protections I've ever seen. So I was pretty happy with my option. I went with their Four Seasons project. It was a Four Seasons hotel. And uh, now I currently have my green card, thanks to that. I'm currently in year three of my five-year process. I have another two years to go. And once that's complete, I should have my permanent green card as well as should have my money back. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier that in between, while you were waiting to for confirmation that your EB-5 application had gone through, you went back to India for about eight months. What was that like, having to go back and not being sure if your application would go through or not? Yeah, that was that was, that was pretty sad, actually. Um, well, firstly, not getting my, my original plan was I would go from an F1 to an H1B and, you know, maybe later my EB-5 would be approved. When I did not get my H-1B, when I was let go from my job, it was pretty devastating. Uh, going back to India wasn't great for me. They don't typically treat entry-level tech workers really well in India, and I kind of felt a big brunt of that. I wasn't happy with the job that I had there. Uh, I was pretty, pretty much just sitting and waiting for my approval to come through. So once that did come through, I went for a visa consular interview and uh, you know walked out of the immigrant visa, uh, went to the U.S. and that was that. But to answer your question, uh, yeah, it wasn't great. Uh, as, really, for me, the U.S. helped me grow. It helped me grow in terms of my career and as a person. And being in India, I felt. I mean, I guess I, really, I was growing as well, but not at the rate at which I would have hoped. So for those of you just joining us, uh, this is a Voice of America student union live stream. I'm Abby. And I'm Taylor. And we're talking with Ishan about uh, EB-5 visas, specifically uh, students getting EB-5 visas. Um, so Ishan, what are some common problems that you see in the EB-5 system? I know there was recently a scandal in Vermont where a regional center was misusing money. What should uh, students who are maybe looking into this option be aware of? Well, first things first, I'd say get a good immigration attorney. Um, you, like I said before, an immigration attorney is the one who's supposed to have your back. So uh, make sure you know, make sure you have a good one. Um, also, keep in mind that your immigration attorney is not supposed to recommend any projects to you you were supposed to go and find the investment option or project on all on your own. So start by doing that. Um, 
I would say talk to, I uh, say the main thing you want to do is avoid middlemen or brokers. Uh, a lot of time they will be paid by the regional center or the investment issuer to go find clients for them. And occasionally, I don't, I don't particularly like working with middlemen. Oftentimes they have their own interests in mind and not yours. So my recommendation really is, is that you know, find a couple of investment options. I think EB5 United is, happens to be a great one. You know, take a look at their website, get in touch with them, start making a list of all the different options that you have. Uh, just to give you guys an example as far as how projects work, you can have two types of investment projects. You can have a debt-based project or an equity-based project. Debt-based or loan-based projects that tend to be more low risk and more low yield. Typically, a loan-based project you get like maybe like half a percent to 0.25 percent a year. Equity-based projects tend to be much more high risk, but the yield tends to be slightly higher as well. So you can probably get like a preferred rate of one percent, two percent, three percent. But I personally don't recommend equity projects to anyone. So I'd say find a debt-based project, find a project that really has enough investor protections to keep your money safe. That's your ultimate goal as an EB-5 investor is to find the project that, hey, that's going to create your jobs, that's going to meet all the USCIS requirements and get your money back. All right. So, Ishan, for our viewers just joining us, would you mind recapping your story again, like what your journey was from an F-1 student visa to an EB-5 investor visa? Sure. So, I was in an F-1 visa. I graduated college in 2016. I uh, was very, very motivated to stay in the U.S., so I did a lot of research. I found out about the EB-5 program. I hired an immigration attorney. I started scouting all my options, and I finally went with EB-5 United. They, I invested in their Four Seasons project, and they helped me get my green card. And uh, two years later, I am now sitting here with, an, with a green card. I currently have a great job in the U.S., and I'm pretty happy with where I am. And so you've been saying a lot of financial terms uh, in this Facebook Live so far. Um, what, is your sense of students or young people who are applying for EB-5 visas, do they generally understand these terms? How familiar do you have to be with these terms in order to be a smart investor? Or is that something that you know your immigration lawyer can help you with or your parents perhaps? Well, I mean, I definitely think that your parents should help you, regardless of how much knowledge you have. But uh, look, I'm an information systems major. I'm a tech guy. Finance really wasn't my thing. I actually remember running up to my finance professor after class and saying, hey, like, what does this mean? What does a first deed of trust mean? Um, I, I think that you don't require a lot of initial knowledge. I mean, I'd say that a basic knowledge of, say, debt investing versus equity investing is pretty good. Uh, but I mean, as, as long as you understand some basic terms, I mean, use Investopedia. I, I will actually use that site multiple times to look up certain terms. But it is it is an uphill battle. You aren't going to understand everything right off the bat. You really have to sit, do your homework, do your research, maybe speak to someone who's on the EB-5. Shoot me a message. I'm, I, I'm always talking to former EB-5 like, or prospective EB-5 investors and uh, always trying to give them advice and help them out in terms of understanding their position, understanding immigration terms, investment terms, because, you know, this essentially, there's essentially two separate paths happening. There's an investment path and an immigration path, and you have to kind of understand both. An immigration path is good because you have an immigration attorney who can explain that to you, but as far as your investment path goes, you really need to do your own research. So... Uh, a, a fairly, I mean, a fairly decent amount of knowledge is required. The best thing I would do is read online. Open Investopedia if you don't understand something. Do you know, Google stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so for our viewers just joining us, can you tell them a little bit more about yourself, like where you're from, um, and why you decided to study what you did in school? Sure. Uh, I'm from New Delhi, India. Uh, I always had a passion for computers, but I wasn't a hardcore coder. I, I knew I wanted to do something in the computer space, but not computer science. And finally, when I actually heard about information systems, I heard about Loyola Marymount's information systems program, which was a good mix of IT and business development in their business school. I knew that's exactly what I wanted to do. So I started, I decided to major in that. 
Okay, and um, are your parents in, in business? How supportive were they during this process? They were pretty supportive. Um, a lot of times when people do the EP-5, it's usually one family that does it. In my case, it was just me. The EB-5 allows the main applicant, their spouse, and any children under the age of 21, unmarried, to get green cards. Now, I was over 21, and my parents don't really have that much of a desire to move to America. They're fine just visiting me occasionally. <laughs> so, um, but, even, but even with that, all that in mind, they've been extremely supportive. Um, they knew that my dream is to stay in America, and they really you know, did everything they could to help me stay there. Um, and what other reasons might someone have, a student in particular, for getting an EB-5, sort of beyond the desire to stay, to work and work in the U.S.? Well, I think the biggest thing, at least for F1 students, is when they realize the opportunities they have access to here in the U.S. And as long as, I suppose, they have, they're motivated and I'm trying to think of other reasons, but I think the biggest thing is usually career growth or some or 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 any other motivation to stay in America. Uh, I can't I can't imagine if I, I think it's particularly useful to especially people in the creative field. Getting an O1 visa, for example, is really hard if you're a dance major or theater major. Um, and an O1 visa? Is that what you said? Yeah, an O-1 visa is uh, basically another non-immigrant visa category. It's what uh, people of extraordinary talent or something might want to pursue. Uh, just to give you an example, Justin Bieber from Canada is on an O-1 visa. <laughs> so, and that's pretty hard to get, too, because you really have to be someone of noteworthy talent. And uh, and if you're unable to get that, and I know a lot of, I mean, a lot of friends who are either dance majors or theater majors, uh, my own sister, in fact, graduated from Middlebury College in Vermont with a, a, a fine arts degree, and she wasn't able to stay here either. So I think for people like that, people in the arts, uh, it, it's, a, it's definitely useful for them. If you're trying to make it into Hollywood or Broadway or something like that, getting an EB-5 is extremely easy. Theater companies are far more open to hiring you knowing that you actually have legal status in the country. They don't have to worry about things like sponsorship and stuff. Um, is your sister older or younger, and did she ever consider an EB-5? Younger than me, and she did consider the EB-5, but I don't think we can avoid it considering I'm the one who's already done it. And I don't think she was as motivated to stay here as I was. So is she back in India now? She's headed back to India this month. Oh, OK, cool. OK, so earlier you kind of talked about that initial culture shock once moving to America. Can you talk a little more about that? Like how, what things did you have to learn? Well, driving on the wrong side of the road, first <laughs> of all. Uh, and then, uh, I guess classroom culture is a bit different too, but really the biggest differences I noticed was more in the corporate environment. The moment you do an internship or get some work experience in the US, you distinctly notice a difference between your culture and theirs. Uh, you know, in India, I kind of look down upon this a little bit. You usually come into the office, you'll have chai time till 11 a.m. You might stay in the office and work until 8 or 9 p.m. In the U.S., it's a bit more clear-cut. A 9 to 5 job is a bit more regular. Uh, I, okay, and, you know, I, I felt a bit more valued as a person, as an, as an employee or in a, in a corporate structure rather than I, than I, rather than I was in India. And I'm not trying to bash their culture or something like that, but I think that it's distinctly different. I think that even as someone who's entering the company or, or a new employee, an intern in a U.S. corporation has a, a really big chance for growth. And for me, that, that was different. That was a really different culture that I hadn't expected before. Otherwise, of course, uh, I guess the other big thing in, I guess, American culture, which I really like, which isn't common, a lot of com isn't really common everywhere else, is kind of the respect that people give you when it comes to your grades and your performance. Uh, in India, it's very common to have your grades posted on boards. Parents will boast how much their kids have gotten after a certain year. 
but in the U.S., I guess people are a bit more respectful of that, and I kind of like that. Um, you know, nobody's out all up in your face saying, how much did you get? But, so that took uh, some of the pressure off? It took some of the pressure, yes, it did take a lot of the pressure off, but also it didn't feel as competitive. The environment, especially in college, felt a bit more uh, nurturing. Um, and, you know, you're talking about the differences in corporate environment, but, um, sorry, um, what about the dress code? Is, was that particularly different between the U.S. and India? Uh, I mean, that's really hard to say because in tech, it, the dress code is definitely a lot more lax than it is anywhere in, in, in the rest, in, like, say, a Wall Street firm or something like that. Uh, that's really unique, I think. I don't think it's like that anywhere else in the world where you can walk into your office with shorts and uh, a v-neck shirt. But uh, tech companies, and this is just specifically towards them who allow for that, is, is rare and it's definitely not common anywhere else in the world. Okay, uh, so can you kind of walk us through your typical work day here in America? So where I I don't work in tech anymore. I work uh, I work in a different industry. Um, I t I typically travel a lot for work. I'm actually in a hotel room right now in Los Angeles. Uh, I mean I, I'm not trying I'm trying to make a give a dis distinct perspective from I say I'd say life in India. Typically in India, you know, get up you try you try to make it to work by like say 8 a.m. Usually the work doesn't actually start until 12 noon. And then you usually end up finishing at about 8, 9 p.m. And over here, you know, it's it's kind of cut off. Like you'll finish your, like you'll do your work during the day, you'll have your lunchtime, whatever. Work day ends at 6 p.m. And uh, that's that. And um, what, what other factors really were surprising about American culture that you didn't expect coming from India? Uh, I mean, I, I really don't want to say a lot of stuff as a surprise. I I used to watch a lot of American movies, and uh, um, I think that it, I, I say I mean I don't want to give the same advice to people and say you know go watch Animal House, go watch American Pie. That's really not what college is going to be like. Uh, but I guess you know when I was in college, I tried to do I tried to really put my immerse myself in the culture. I joined a fraternity in my freshman year of college. I you know joined many of them student orgs and groups, and uh, uh, it wasn't like Animal House, but it definitely gave me a greater sense of community. And it, and my fraternity, for example, became my home away from home. So uh, I, I definitely encourage people who were looking to you know get into college and all is immerse yourselves get into what you know the local communities have to offer get into what college has to offer you love it yeah. okay so can you talk a little bit more about what you do when you're not at work like what do you do for fun in california uh what do I do for fun in california um i i really especially being in los angeles i really like hiking uh, I've you know, done the Hollywood sign hike multiple times. I've gone to the beach. Outdoors options is a lot, but really my favorite thing to do is actually driving. Um, compared to a third world country, driving in this country is a wonderful experience. Hitting the open road, going through Yosemite or any of your other national parks, it's a or driving down PCH, you know, convertible if you can. It, it are amazing experiences, and I think that everyone should experience that. Uh, America is extremely vast uh, compared to other countries, and uh, really getting to explore some parts of it that you may not explore before is is worth it. Uh, I, for example, did a road trip to Montana at one point, at one point, and I got to see parts of the Bible Belt. Uh, I drove through all these small towns and all, and it's and it's a completely different culture, and I really like that. So, what's the the um, nightlife like in Los Angeles? <laughs> and also, what sort of car do you drive? <laughs> uh, I used to I used to own a car. I used to have a little Honda Insight. It was my baby. I loved it. Um, nightlife is great. I mean, it, it's also expensive. 
but you know as long as you're with your friends if you're doing dive bars and gastropubs it's definitely worth it. I'm not really a, too much of a nightclub person myself. I've been going once in a while, but I mean, it's going like just like New York. I mean, LA benefits from having a younger crowd, and I think that the options here are endless. In fact, my favorite place to go out, and I guess my favorite bar, would be this bar in towards the north of LA called Button Mash. And it's a typical bar, but it's lined wall to wall with these old arcade games from the 80s and the 90s. And it is really nostalgic, it's very retro, and I love it. I love the coin machines. It you know, sends you back to a time when people used to actually hang out at arcades, and so that was a thing to do. So I, I, I really like that. And I know that, and I know that sort of, you know, 50s arcade, arcade retro thing, thing is very big, big in, uh, in America. Now. Was that culture sort of ever a new culture, or is it? Um, Sort of unique to hear. Uh, yeah, it is pretty unique to hear. I mean, I, I love walking into a typical 80s, 90s diner and trying out their milkshake, for example. It, it isn't something that's prevalent anywhere else um, in India. So uh, it's a little, yeah, it's a little piece of history that, that that is unique. I mean, take for example, speakeasies. A lot of people, especially in India, don't know about prohibition, for example. I know that was a whole different era. Uh, I love checking out, like, you know, cool speakeasies, hidden away bars. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. And what's the uh, dating scene like? <laughs> um, very, very different. Uh, I think that... You know, it's it's much less conservative compared to India, and I'm really glad for that. I I, I don't, I mean, I think everything has its ups and uh, pluses and minuses. I feel like people here are a bit more flaky than than India, but uh, I mean, without being too crass, I think that dating in America is definitely far more interesting for me. I'm not going to get judged for going on a date with someone and then different person the week after. But uh, yeah, uh, and, and, and I like the fact it's much less judgmental. And I mean, I mean, just to, and also, but like to state the obvious, but LGBTQ representation, for example, why may not be part of the community, I think that members of that community benefit from being here in the US. Uh, I have a school friend of mine who recently came out as bi, and I knew, I know that things happened weren't typically easy for him. In India it was, and I don't think his parents know about him. And, you know, being in America, I know he's been able to express his individuality and be honest with people about who he is. And I think that has definitely been really good for him. So I imagine for people like that, being here in, in, a, in a place which is much more accepting of you, being in a country where your sexuality isn't illegal, for example, is, is a big deal. So I think that, you know, as, I mean, as the dating scene goes, hey, I love it. But you know, really for those people who wouldn't normally be able to date, uh, I think it's even better for them. And what's your friend group like? Do you feel like it's more diverse here than it would have been had you stayed in India? You know, you mentioned that you had a friend that came out as bisexual recently. Has that made a difference in your life, do you think? Um, yeah, definitely. I'd say my friend group is pretty diverse. Uh, I have actually have very few friends from India who I'm friends with over here. It's mostly all high school friends and people that I may have gone to college with. Uh, most of my friends typically tend to be uh, from the U.S., either from California or small towns across the U.S. Uh, and it's really cool because I, I get a varying amount of opinions and different interests, uh, you know, uh, and, and people from other countries as well. Take LA, for example. LA is really, really diverse. Uh, I tried Korean barbecue for the first time a couple of years ago. I went to Chicago and tried deep dish pizza with my friends who were born and raised there. Having all these different experiences and, and different perspectives was, was massive for me. I mean, it really expands your world. Um, and what about Bollywood versus Hollywood? You know, you're in LA now. What's the difference between the major like film scenes? 
uh, a lot less singing and dancing in Hollywood, which I, which I prefer. I mean, I, I, I'm okay with Bollywood. I'm not impressed with the quality of the films that they produce. Uh, they very rarely do they put out a good film. But um, I mean, I had to pick, I guess, at big Hollywood. But also, I mean, I also don't really particularly like the impression that Bollywood gives to people. I mean, it's not like I'm going to land in Delhi tomorrow and there's going to be a set of backup dancers and singers waiting for me at the airport, waiting to get into that. But uh, it, it, it's, I mean, there's, there's a lot more to it than that, is what I would tell people. If you're going to get into watching Bollywood, there's a lot of serious films that I would personally recommend. But yeah, I prefer Hollywood. Which films would you recommend? Sorry, say that again? Uh, which films would you recommend? Sorry, what, what would I recommend? Oh, uh, films. Which Bollywood films? Uh, I guess I'd probably go my favorite one, which is Lagan. I, I would recommend that. It's actually it's a story about uh, old post uh, pre-colonial British India when there was a cricket match that took place that basically decided the fate of the control of a village. I thought that's really cool. I think that's really worth checking out. It, it really kind of gives perspective because a lot of people you know, especially Americans over here don't realize that we were under British control for the longest time. And it kind of gives them a unique sense of our history and sort of how we've grown as a people. Like, take something as simple as my accent, for example. A lot of people, when I came to the U.S., you know, couldn't quite figure it out. Uh, and for, like all the words that we write, the way we spell color or pronounce aluminum, uh, we use the British... English version of words, and in people don't realize that until you know they say like, wait a second, you're, you know, it's not Indian English, it's more like British English, and and they, there's a comparison between that and American English. All right, well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. But thank you so much for joining us. You've been an excellent guest. Uh, this has been a Voice of America Student Union live stream with Ishan Khanna. Um, do you have anything else to add before we sign off? Uh, yeah, I mean, as, as far as the EB-5 visa program goes, I'd say do your due diligence. First, sit down with your family and decide that, you know, hey, is this worth it for me? Uh, keep in mind that this is an at-risk investment. You're not going to see your money for at least five years. Keep all that in mind when doing your homework. But I will say the benefits do outweigh the costs. If you want to stay in America without any restrictions, without any need for sponsorship, you want to walk through, you know, the, the immigration line extremely easily, this is the this is the way to do it. Otherwise, there is currently no other viable immigration option right now when it comes to the U.S. Every option that exists right now is pretty tough to get, especially with the current administration. So, but I mean, as far as EB-5 goes, I think the U.S. government loves it. It creates jobs in the economy and at no cost to the American taxpayer. Uh, I think I, I, I think that if, as long as people do their homework properly, don't put their money in risky investments or try to start their own businesses or something with EB-5, I think you'll be just fine. All right. I'm Abby. And I'm Taylor. And thanks so much for watching this Voice of America Student Union live stream. All right. Bye. Bye.